مرحبا بالجميع في الجلسة السابعة من مؤتمر. Welcome to this seventh session of the conference, comparative successes, failures, and stalemates. We have four panelists who shall be talking about the comparative successes, failures, and stalemates. And uh, we shall start with the first paper delivered by Professor David Darciachvili. And uh, he is a professor at the School of Arts and Sciences in Ilya State University in Georgia. He served as a member of the Georgian Parliament uh, between 2008-2016. He uh, published a member of studies and book chapters. Most recently co-authored with the Stephen Jones and entitled Georgia Warlords Generals and Politicians, uh, published by Oxford Research Encyclopedia. Dr. Darchashvili's paper is entitled From War to Democracy, How Did the Georgian Civil War Transform? The floor is yours, sir. Please go ahead. Dr. David, could you please open the mic? Microphone is muted. Could you unmute? Sorry, sorry. Yes, I was just thanking uh, all organizers for this wonderful conference. Let me share uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, well, here it is. So uh, I'm going to talk um, about the issue um, uh, our. <clears throat> Uh, host just uh, announced, uh, but only with a little difference. I have a question mark uh, under uh, just at the end of this sentence, uh, indicating that uh, it's still doubtful whether Georgia moved towards stable democracy or not. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk on political, uh, social, and a little bit of culture and then geopolitical uh, aspects of Georgian turmoil, which we experience throughout the 30 years since independence. So uh, to summarize from the very beginning, what I am going to say, uh, you see the bullet points here, these old wounds which uh, were present, which led to civil war, uh, do not disappear. They still resonate somehow in uh, political uh, life of Georgian society. But uh, there are some uh, elements which uh, hamper um, uh, conflicts since uh, certain developments. And uh, I would uh, stress here on uh, Georgia's intensive relations with the European Union uh, since 2016, where uh, in a uh, association agreement with the um, European Union. And of course, it uh, took a while to reach the stage of uh, integration. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that is important factor in uh, Georgia's development. Uh, but on the other hand, we still face rather troublesome uh, political developments, especially in 2019-2021. Uh, there are new features of confrontation between the government and the opposition which may develop um, in a rather um, unpleasant way, but it still remains to be seen. And I will be uh, discussing shortly these developments. What is a, a, another um, uh, positive aspect um, uh, in uh, Georgia's move from civil war modalities into more or less stable statehood? That is the fact that army in Georgia remains neutral. Uh, we don't have much of the experience of military rule. Uh, it is not very much in the tradition of Georgian uh, men at arms and uh, uniformed uh, institutions. 
And uh, again, uh, uh, European Union and the United States try to mediate between current uh, opposition and the government. And by the way, we will have uh, local elections in a couple of weeks. So uh, it, will, it will show so where we stand now. So uh, important factors to summarize um, is uh, that, uh, again, absence of the military uh, rule tradition and closeness to liberal democratic rule of law based um, community, which whether we like it or not, whether we adhere to their um, uh, suggestions, uh, advices or not, still somehow makes a difference, I think. So uh, just a few words about Georgia. It's uh, of course post-totalitarian, uh, small and at the same time, one would say post-colonial state. Uh, and uh, maybe that uh, uh, makes Georgia similar to many other places around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, as to the uh, civil war, which we experienced from 1991 to 1993, they were, it was caused by several internal and external uh, factors. And uh, a part of peculiarities, which are purely Georgian, I mean, uh, indigenous uh, factors, one would say about more general features of, of then Georgia, which led eventually to these armed clashes. That was a Soviet social heritage, uh, contributing to the emergence of the uh, rivaling clans, because Georgian society was uh, susceptible to such development as soon as totalitarian uh, sort of constraints were somehow lifted. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, that was again Soviet political heritage, which um, uh, sort of uh, contributed to the uh, roots of zero sum uh, game kind of political culture in Georgia when the um, habits of compromises are absent. And uh, also the, the third factor, I would say, that is privatization of uh, the structures of violence. When those structures either inherited from Soviet times or uh, built anew were used by groups, clans for their private political power uh, or, or just purely commercial interests. Uh, is now now about very Georgian peculiarities because each story is unique in a sense. So uh, we faced uh, a rivalry among old communist clans, which uh, ruled uh, in late Soviet times, and this rivalry continued because those clans did not disappear. Uh, especially, I mention here the Edward Chevardnadze, who might be known internationally as a former uh, minister of foreign affairs of the Soviet Union uh, and, and others, other Georgian communists uh, and they, their rivalry uh, was going up to uh, imprisoning uh, representatives of each other using court and prosecution for their political purposes. Uh, Soviet uh, era social stratification was also very interesting and peculiar. One Georgian uh, scholar uh, uh, characterized it as a um, uh, sort of third way of stratification, not uh, like uh, status based as, as it was happening in, in feudal times or in, in traditional uh, periods. Uh, neither uh, wealth-based as it happens in uh, sort of uh, market uh, economy-driven um, polities, but it was territory-based. So the closer uh, person was territorially to the centers of power, more um, opportunities he had. 
So it made uh, capital dwellers a bit privileged in comparison with provincial city dwellers, even more privileged in comparison with village dwellers and so on and so forth. Even in the capital, it very much depended which particular district person was from. <coughs> Animosity between this communist uh, ruling class, which um, is called nomenclatura, that's the Latin term meaning the list of the items. And the nomenclatura meant that special positions from uh, administrative and political till even university uh, rector or chair positions were uh, filled under the consent of central communist leadership. And they themselves called this list of the positions nomenclatura. So these people who were filling these positions were the, basically the ruling class, famous uh, 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 Yugoslavian, my colleague from Serbia will correct me, which particular part of then Yugoslavia he was, Milovan Gilak uh, developed this notion of uh, communist ruling class. Uh, anyway, and this, uh, uh, but, but what was interesting that eventually by the end of the Soviet Union, animosity between nomenclatura and new nationalists uh, developed. There were some connections between them through um, intelligentsia uh, uh, people, through even uh, criminals, because criminals were always influential in corrupt political systems, and also through shadow uh, entrepreneurs. But in, in normal situation, these linkages could have developed uh, in a sort of uh, compromise based some kind of uh, political um, system, but not in Georgia, zero sum culture uh, did not help in this respect. And these connections were between nomenclatura and new nationalist uh, faction of the ruling class were rather inflammable. Uh, well, uh, so all that developed I would say two tire confrontations, which eventually led to the civil war. Inability of the old faction and the newcomers to find some kind of understanding, some kind of power sharing among each other. Newcomers after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, perceived that there was no place and no time left for the communist nomenclatura, but as it uh, was soon revealed, these uh, old clans had their own uh, leverages of influence. Uh, but there were also rivalries within these camps. As I mentioned, the communists were not very much united. There were different factions, groups, uh, led by charismatic people. And same happened to the nationalistic camp. Those leaders could not agree neither or share of the power among themselves, nor about the tactics, how to develop new Georgian <coughs> statehood, independent one. Uh, and all was exacerbated by emergence of uh, armed units, militias, which was also very <coughs> fragmented, consisting of, of, consisting of many uh, units, which had no central uh, hierarchy of command. And some of them were leaning towards old, old uh, influential people, like for example, Notorious Mkhedrioni, which can be translated as a horseman and composed of uh, mostly of uh, youngsters from the central part of Tbilisi, which was traditionally privileged, socially privileged part, and some other units. <coughs> so uh, eventually, uh, I mean, uh, at first there was the, the election and then the communists were defeated, but very soon uh, this uh, new government faced ethnic clashes, which added to the um, in itself complex situation. <coughs> National minorities 
were uh, demanding their own share in a new uh, state arrangement. <coughs> so it led to the ethnic clashes. But besides that, a new nationalist government uh, uh, showed kind of uh, intolerance towards any sort of opposition among even uh, stemming from the same nationalistic milieu. And uh, so there were features of repressions and authoritarianism, which led to the unification of the opposition. Some old communists, uh, those leftover nationalists, so they David, united. Sorry? You, you have three minutes left. <clears throat> okay, and that's how we enter the civil war. Well, then I would not uh, say too much about the civil war itself. That's the Eduard Chevardnadze. Uh, actually, uh, the, the civil war coincided with ethnic wars in uh, Abkhazian and Ossetian enclaves, <coughs> and Georgia, his government was defeated eventually. And uh, some kind of a Pax Rosica or the return of the Russian influence uh, in, also <coughs> was faced, but not uh, very long. And uh, since 98, probably one could say, with the help of uh, Turkish then president, uh, Suleyman Demirel, Georgia became involved in this pipeline projects. Then again, uh, lack of Russian interest or capacity to help the consolidation of Georgian statehood also irritated. Shevardnadze experienced assassination attempts and these uh, attempts were somehow directly, indirectly linked to some Russian circles. All that uh, made Georgia move towards the West. But then new, new confrontation emerged. 2003, Rose Revolution. Government was changed through revolution. Luckily, peacefully, but yet it showed that still the societies split. <coughs> But it was eventually followed by new Russian assertiveness linked to the new president, then new president Vladimir Putin, and which eventually caused the, I mean, uh, disagreement between revolutionary Georgian, very assertive government, and no less assertive revisionist Putin's regime uh, clashed in a Russian Georgian civil war. So, what we have now, oh, sorry. <coughs> Again, uh, we have civil strife, but not war. Why? And I will just summarize here everything. Uh, the state apparatus is relatively strong. I mean, law enforcement. When revolution happened, on before that, when civil war happened, um, the state apparatus was in complete uh, <coughs> disarray. Now it's different. Environment is structured, and as uh, conflict uh, specialists say, when the environment is structured, certain institutions exist, it can help to channel grievances into election-like processes. So that's what we face now. Foreign factor, I started with that. Georgia is intensively involved in implementing uh, European Neighborhood Policy Action Plan or NATO Individual Partnership Plan. Somehow it also makes Georgia relatively peaceful in comparison with the beginning of 90s. But yet what we face, it's a constant monopolization of the power, which makes opposition, makes the critical media somehow marginalized. <clears throat> and in July 2021, we suddenly uh, faced uh, kind of a strange turn from the government. Government decided to withdraw from EU brokered peace accord between the opposition and the government, and even refused to take loan from the European Union. Does it mean that government tries to turn towards the north, towards Russia, and become again, once again, Russian oriented or not? still remains to be seen. In masses, we face crisis of identity. That is, again, a cultural feature. From the one hand, majority of Georgians show the pragmatism to be linked with the Western markets and to having good, good relations with the European structures. But on the other hand, there is a strong influence of Orthodox Church, which does not easily take 
principles of democracy, rule of law, human rights on its board, and uh, but uh, has uh, very serious influence over the ordinary citizens in Georgia. So that's it. Basically, Georgia remains uneasy split society. But since 93, we luckily avoided repetitions of the civil war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. Uh, and and the Ram, uh, Dr. Da David, now we move to the second paper entitled From War to Democracy, how did uh, from civil war to security sector reform, assessing Serbia and the Western Balkans after the Yugoslav civil war. Dr. Luka Stretch, he is a researcher at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. He specializes in international politics and security. He got his master's degree from University of Belgrade, as well as a master's degree from Global Studies after studying at the Joint Master's Program in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this distinguished conference. I will try to briefly cover the lessons learned from the aftermath of the ex-Yugoslavian Civil War. Actually, I should say ex-Yugoslavian civil wars, since there were several of them, starting from the brief one in Slovenia, uh, and then series of wars in Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Kosovo throughout the 1990s. And uh, I'll try to explain or uh, briefly uh, show the, the demonstrate uh, the road from conflict to pacification and nation building uh, in these countries to the democratization and unfortunately back to the authoritarian hybrid regimes throughout this region. Unfortunately, we don't have much time to cover uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, I hope you're all familiar with the concept of the country. It was a multicultural country building its own version of communism uh, throughout the 20th century, which was somewhat, somewhat closer to the socialism and was a part of the non-aligned movement. Uh, but unfortunately, it collapsed in this bloody civil war uh, in the 1990s. So I will try to describe this process uh, <clears throat> of uh, uh, democratization and uh, then again authoritarianization uh, through the process uh, focusing more, more specifically on the security sector and transition in, in this process. Uh, because these institutions such as military, police, intelligence service, etc. Uh, have a key role in successful pacification, but also in democratization of uh, states and regions, but of, of course can play uh, a completely opposite uh, uh, function as well. Uh, the case study I will be examining in details in Serbia, uh, but uh, most of these processes can be uh, seen in, to a certain extent in uh, most of these countries of the region, and uh, hopefully by the end of the presentation, if we have the time, I'll try to zoom out and briefly cover the current fragile situation in other, in other countries of the region as well. Uh, <clears throat> so the question that I was trying to uh, answer with this, uh, I will try to answer with this presentation is how to build uh, more sustainable peace and stability in countries and regions which have gone through the painful ex experience of the civil war. And I think there are many lessons to be learned from the Yugoslavian and more specifically Serbian case. Uh, so throughout the, all countries of the region, but especially Serbia, we can follow the, let's say three phases of the post-conflict era. The first phase would be the nation building of the 1990s, uh, which was followed by the, the construction of uh, this form of Yugoslav socialism and multiculturalism. Uh, and the, the rise of authoritarianism behind the mask of nation, national, nationalism in all these countries. It was also followed by the economic downfall. And of course, the security sector was controlled and uh, uh, was actually protecting the authoritarian regimes throughout these countries. This is specifically also uh, uh, the case in Serbia and the regime of Slovan Milosevic. Uh, then this, uh, this period was followed by the road towards the democratization. Um, which in some countries started uh, earlier in the late 1990s, but uh, in the case of Serbia started in, uh, in, in, in the 2000s, more specifically in the year 2000. And uh, this period was uh, followed by the path towards the EU integration of the region, the promise of uh, economic and political uh, transition and liberalization, uh, the process of building of democratic institutions, the market liberalization as well, and, and the security sector reform, which I'll be covering uh, soon. 
But unfortunately, it had also the flip side, uh, and uh, this flip side was the creation of the new economic and political class, uh, uh, the deconstruction of the institutions of the welfare state uh, that was uh, uh, embedded in the Yugoslavian system, uh, which also led, of course, to the explosive widening of the economic and social gap between winners and losers of the, of the transition and uh, uh, the politically influenced and corrupt privatization process, which led to many factories being closed and uh, the high uh, uh, unemployment rate in the countries and uh, also political fragmentation in, in these countries. Uh, all of these processes uh, led to the reversible trends that you can see in the, uh, the 2010s in last, over the last decade, where throughout these countries, we can see the transition being in, in the stalemate or even the, restore, uh, the, the restoration of uh, authoritarianism in some countries, uh, such as Serbia specifically, where under the mask of uh, fight against corruption, uh, uh, the, the, the state government actually led to the, we see the process of state capture being uh, uh, happening. And uh, of course, the rise of uh, your skepticism as the result of uh, this seemingly never ending process of uh, European integration, uh, which, which uh, of course led to the uh, legitimization of the process of uh, authoritarianism again uh, <clears throat> and also it was held by the i have to say by the eu and other western actors uh, which have been the main drivers outside drivers of this uh, uh, transition period uh, throughout the, uh, the the 2000s as they have turned more towards the stabilocracy uh, instead of democratization in this in this uh, region because of their own uh, internal instability because of the migration crisis etc cetera, etc cetera. And uh, uh, all of this has been followed by the revi revival of the aggressive nationalistic rhetoric uh, in a somewhat new form and new rise of the new threats uh, to the regional stability and peace, which unfortunately uh, are uh, looming over the region at the moment. So uh, let me now try to uh, explain in briefly the case on the case study of Serbia, how this uh, process of democratization first took place and especially the process of security sector reform that was following this process. So, uh, as I have briefly mentioned, uh, in the 1990s, this uh, autocratic regime of Slobodan Milosevic uh, led Serbia to the series of conflicts uh, in the region uh, and the uh, extreme economic downfall driven by the external sanctions, as well as the massive inflation in the country. And uh, this autocratic regime has been uh, changed after the elections in 2000s and the mass demonstrations that, was, that were following this, these elections uh, and the new democratic regime has uh, built its legitimacy uh, on the promise of democratization inspired by the principles of Western democracies and under the umbrella of the EU accession process, which was promised to all the countries of the region. And uh, an important part of this democratization process was the security sector reform, understood as the set of policies and procedures developed uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, have a more efficient provision of human and state security within the framework of uh, democratic rule. And there are some main principles to this uh, security sector reform. Um, uh, transparency, uh, first of all, uh, and this can be seen as a general transparency. So uh, introduction of uh, laws and institutions uh, which have been established to ensure uh, free access to information of public importance, uh, which is especially important uh, since the security bodies have been operating largely in secrecy, uh, especially uh, in intelligence service, of course, and that was uh, the, the 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 firm grip of the regime was behind this uh, these services. Uh, unfortunately, there was there was lacking uh, the financial transparency, uh, but there are some major uh, achievements uh, in this uh, in transparency uh, in establishing transparency as a principle. Then there's a principle a principle of uh, accountability. Uh, more specifically, the democratic civilian control uh, by the executive branch, uh, which was, again, especially important because of the intelligence, but also the police and military, since these, uh, uh, these actors have been some of the, uh, they have been trying to, uh, in the, especially in the early days of democratization, uh, there have been some attempts by the representatives of the Asian regime, uh, which were still incorporated in these bodies to overturn the democratic process. So it was uh, important for the executive branch of the power to uh, regain the, the control over these, these bodies. Then, of course, the parliamentary control, uh, which has uh, especially uh, gained control over the operations of the intelligence service. 
uh, judicial control and of course the public oversight of this process. Uh, next, uh, uh, next principle would be the participation of citizens and civil sector in the formulation, implementation and evaluation of the state, state security policy. Uh, then the representativeness, uh, which would be seen as a proportional gender and national uh, representation based on non-discrimination, which was mostly important in the parts of the country where ethnic minorities were the majority. And then uh, we have seen the system of quota being introduced uh, to ensure the ethnic minorities in these regions to actually have the, their own representatives in the police. And of course, uh, introduction of women in the armed forces. And finally, the rule of law, which can be seen as the adoption of systemic laws for all for each of these uh, state actors, regulating each branch of the security sector, and of course, the protecting of human rights citizens, of, of citizens and state employees in the security sector. So this process, as I said, as I said, had uh, some major flaws as well. Fortunately, not so much in the security sector, but in uh, other uh, aspects such as uh, uh, the the economic part and the privatization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this led to the grievances that, uh, fortunately, led to another regime change in 2012, in the case of Serbia, which was fueled, as I said, by the failed expectation of the democratic regime, but also by the promise of uh, eradicating this mass corruption of the of the last regime of course this was just a mask for the complete demolition demolition of the, all democratical uh, practices uh, which led to the new form of uh, autocrat autocracy more specifically more specifically known as the state capture uh, so uh, the state capture uh, can be described as a process in which uh, individuals and groups uh, more specifically political elites business mag and criminal groups gradually and systemically change the democratic rules of the game in all sectors of society and of the state in order to pursue their own interests on the expense of the uh, of the public interest. And this process goes, of course, be well beyond the, the security sector, but it is uh, arguably the most important one because uh, of the monopoly, monopoly of the over the use of uh, uh, force, which is critical as the last result of every uh, autocratic regime. So I'll try to briefly break down how this state capture actually looks like at the moment in Serbia uh, <clears throat> uh, by explaining how it looks like in each of these uh, sectors or each of the uh, uh, security bodies. First of all, the first step was capturing the parliament as the main controlling body over the executive and the security sector uh, uh, as well. And this capturing of parliament uh, it w went uh, first with the unfree elections, with the mass uh, media manipulations, pressures, and electoral frauds, uh, which was used to completely fragment and uh, diminish uh, the power of the opposition in parliament. And then the obstruction of plenary sessions, such as the mass use of uh, urgent le legislative procedures to bypass public discussion, uh, submitting a huge number of amendments by the governing party themselves to their own uh, uh, propositions to reduce the time available to the opposition to discuss these uh, uh, these uh, changes or these new laws being introduced, then constantly changing the agenda, uh, merging different items of the agenda into one uh, uh, big discussion, so they would cover up the more uh, uh, troubling parts of the discussion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, through the obstruction of uh, parliamentary com committees by adopting uh, proposed legislation uh, pretty much automatically without discussing it, shortening the sessions to uh, most specifically to, to a couple of minutes, usually never debating uh, budgets, etc., etc. Then it was led by the capturing of the police. Uh, there are several aspects to this, uh, to this process as well. First of all, the process of non-transparency, so limiting the information uh, on the politically sensitive case. Sorry? Three minutes left. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so the non-transparency by limiting the information on politically sensitive cases, uh, then the nepotism and part, uh, party patronage over the human resources by adopting the amendments to the laws uh, in which the Minister of Interior, uh, appointed of course by the government, can appoint people on vacancies without the regular competitive procedure, uh, uh, political management, uh, no parliamentary control, etc., etc. Uh, then capturing of uh, sec uh, security services, actually the, the intelligence as well, in, uh, by amending the laws uh, <clears throat> to use the urgent procedure to assure the then prime minister and at the moment the president of the country, the position of the coordinator of these intelligence services, which gave him the direct control over the intelligence service. 
then the party control over the services by directly imposing the secretary of the uh, intelligence and other posts uh, and uh, never have the open uh, call for the vacancies in the intelli intelligence services, broadening the scope of uh, uh, discretionary powers and reducing transparency, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the same process can be seen uh, in the military. So the capturing of the military was uh, marked by the broadening of the scope of secrecy of data and, of course, uh, non-transparency in arms procurement leading to the corruption practice uh, in which uh, private companies connected with the government would get uh, all, the, uh, uh, all the procurements of the arms uh, and, of course, uh, this way obtaining the profit and uh, uh, also transferring competencies of the state actors uh, to the private security as an instrument of pumping the public funds funds out of the state budget and of course towards the political uh, elite. So uh, this is how the state capture looks like in Serbia. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to uh, go over the situation in other countries of the region as well. Uh, just briefly, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have the case of the near failed state at the moment with the failure of the multiculturalism pro uh, project that was uh, uh, established after the, uh, the conflict there and the political fragmentation to the level of non-functionality of uh, federal institutions and, of course, the delegitimization of uh, foreign-led stabilization process. In Montenegro, we went from the nation building uh, uh, and the uh, so-called liberal authoritarianism of the benevolent uh, autocrat uh, uh, in Milo Djukanovic to the new wave of democratization last year. But unfortunately, this, this democratization has been followed also by the rise of uh, ethnic and political destabilization, uh, which is uh, very troubling at, uh, at the moment. And of course, the case of North Macedonia, which uh, once again went through the uh, enormous uh, efforts to uh, uh, you know, followed the EU path and uh, made this uh, uh, huge uh, uh, deal with with Greece concerning the name of the country, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, only to be betrayed by the uh, EU officials and uh, this uh, and not uh, you know uh, going on with this uh, EU accession process. Uh, and this is a dangerous, of course, precedent for the whole region, demonstrating the EU lack of support for democratization in the region. So the question is, what can be learned from this uh, obviously non-linear process uh, of democratization in the region? And uh, how can we ensure the more sustainable democratization process? And I hope uh, that this region can offer some of the, some of the uh, answers to these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Loka. Uh, Nadaima al-waraqa al-thalith al-an. Now we have the third presentation. And uh, the third presentation is entitled The Libyan Civil War and the Challenges of Peace Prospects by Dr. Ali al Wahichi from Azawi University. And uh, a, he got his PhD from Idaho University in the United States. Dr. Ali, please, you have 15 minutes. Uh, in my paper, I'll be dealing with the question of uh, the Libyan civil war and the challenges of peace prospects. Libya has seen a political change in 2011 as a result of the uh, Arab Spring, which ended in the ending of the Gaddafi regime and the establishment of a new path towards democratization. But sooner rather than later, the political and military forces and Libya started competing over power and everybody was attempting a power grab and this opened the door uh, 
to regional and international interference and led the country into a situation of civil war. And despite the efforts exerted by the United Nations and to minimize the differences and divisions and to avoid the division of the country on the basis of tribalism and regionalism, and the attempts to end the period of transition and to evict all the mercenaries according to a roadmap which should lead to a general election on the 24th of December 2021. Yet uh, the parties benefiting from the current situation are still resisting. The paper poses a few questions like what are the causes for the civil war in Libya and also why the regional and international of, uh, uh, actors got involved and what are the challenges facing attempts to make peace and establish peace. The conflict in Libya did not start overnight. It was the outcome of some 42 years of oppression and despite Gaddafi's claims that his regime was based on popular mandate. There were no such thing. The first signs of civil war started in January 2011 in the Benghazi region, which was a continuation of what has happened in Tunisia and Egypt. Security Council responded by authorizing or a number of resolutions. Number one was uh, uh, 1270 or 1970, which was passed on the 27th of February 2011, which posed some sanctions on arms sales and froze the Libyan financial assets abroad and banned major uh, uh, leaders the country of uh, traveling and also the civil war the first civil war lasted for eight months and ended with the killing of Gaddafi on the 20th of October 2011 and the collapse of his regime a national transitional council took over for 10 months at the end of the civil war, then the first democratic elections were um, formed on the 7th of July 2012. The authority was transferred to the National Council. The second civil war, uh, the period uh, and aftermath of the 2011 uh, troubles was uh, the, uh, characterized by the weakness of the government and the internal strife and conflict. Uh, the democratic elections were, for, were uh, uh, organized uh, in 2012, which were considered uh, free and uh, honest, but uh, the the National Congress uh, uh, faced uh, a number of challenges, lack of vision to manage the transitional period, the internal uh, strife and fighting over power between the different political blocs. And also there were, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, administrative and financial corruption. The National Conference extended this authority on more than one occasion by itself. All of this led to a second civil war in Libya when this was led by Khalifa Khaftar on the 18th of May 20, 
14 when he called for the freezing of the government and the National Congress, which led to the third civil war. The third civil war in Libya came at a time when there were preparations underway for an inclusive national conference, which was called for by the UN envoy, Hassan Salama, to find a problem. Yet Khalifa Haftar preceded this uh, attempt and declared his war on the 4th of April 2019. And this led to a situation of war which lasted more than one year and turned Libya into an arena where international and regional forces were competing with each other. The Turkish intervention changed the situation upside down because uh, the, the Turkish help and support of the National Accord government led to the demise of the Haftar military campaign, and he has no more uh, stronghold except in Sirte, and the fall of Sirte would mean the end of his military presence in the western parts of the country. As for the international and regional intervention, it is known that Libya suffered from lack of political and security instability since 2011, and this has hindered the democratization process and turned Libya into an arena for proxy wars between different parties with different ideological backgrounds. Also, the foreign actors continue providing military and financial support and help to their support to their proxies and this of course has hindered the UN's efforts exerted to uh, uh, save the country from the situation it was in also there was an exchange of accusations between the warring factions. Uh, Haftar was accused of bringing mercenaries uh, from the outside, from the Janjaweed and Wagner in Russia. The Turkish side was accused of bringing mercenaries from Syria. The Turkish support of the National Accord government has led to halting the advance by the Haftar forces when they were only kilometers away from controlling the capital, Tripoli. Also, uh, the Haftar forces were supported by Jordan, and France, Libya, and others. And uh, also, uh, the, uh, the, Egyptian, the Egyptian parliament uh, decided to send forces to Libya as a result of the Turkish intervention because they considered Libya their own strategic courtyard. By October 2020, military operations ceased as a result of international pressures, and then came the ceasefire agreement between the warring factions and the result uh, Haftar could not uh, control the western cities, neither could the government forces control the eastern cities. The UN's efforts uh, have not uh, stopped since 2011, uh, 2011 but uh, they were very fragile and their decisions were not binding. If we look at the negotiations, the peace negotiations, which were held outside the Libyan territory, they were all outside Libya and France, Italy, the UAE, as well as Cairo, Moscow, all of these capitals have hosted these negotiations. They all were doomed to failure because all of them were part and parcel of the struggle and they were not honest brokers. Also, the national unity government 
was formed at last in the hope of ending the civil war and to finding a credible partner to fight terrorism and uh, illegal uh, migration. On the 19th of January 2020, the first Berlin International Conference over Libya was held at the invitation of Chancellor uh, Merkel and the discussions uh, ended in four outcomes, ceasefire, banning of, of weapons, uh, financial and economic uh, uh, reform. Although the warring parties have managed to stop fighting on the 23rd of October 2020, and which was uh, prevalent throughout uh, the Libyan territory, and there was a timeline for the withdrawal of all mercenary forces uh, at the end of three months. Also, the formation of a joint military operational command and agreements on the exchange of prisoners, etc. Uh, although the ceasefire was successfully held, but the withdrawal of all mercenaries within 90 days did not happen. On the 23rd of June 2021, uh, the second Berlin um, conference was held to discuss the continued challenges and threats like uh, questions pertaining to human rights, fighting terrorism, and uh, the continued presence of uh, mercenaries. As for the challenges, undoubtedly the interference by foreign governments has complicated and perpetuated the conflict and constituted, uh, constituted a challenge to international efforts. This can be summarized in few in the following points. As long as there is no national reconciliation, there will be no, there will be no peace and stability. Questions like restoring rights and compensation, etc. None of this has happened, so therefore this remains as an obstacle. Also, the unification of the military establishment. Dr. Ali, you have three minutes to finish. Also, uh, the unification of the military uh, establishment is of the essence because that would consolidate peace and stability. As for uh, evicting the foreign forces is a big challenge because until now there is no clear mechanism to do that and undoubtedly that constitutes a major obstacle. Stephanie Williams, the acting UN envoy, said that there are around 20,000 mercenaries and 10 military bases, foreign military bases in Libya for this reason. The five plus five of the Joint Military Committee in Libya has called for the freezing of military agreements between the National Accord Government and Turkey. Now some six months have passed since the establishment of the new government in Libya, but they have not reached new mechanisms to hold the general elections and Yakovic, the special envoy to Libya, informed or briefed the Security Council that the Libyan uh, belligerent parties now are invited to different uh, fighting and competing uh, blocks and this exacerbates the situation. Some conclusions we can use. The conclusions, the continued uh, military and financial uh, support by the outside powers to internal fighting factions prolongs and protracts the conflict. Also, Libya has become an arena for geostrategic competition 
Also, the continued divisions within the Libyan society is an obstacle to national reconciliation and peacemaking. We cannot achieve permanent peace in Libya until and unless the Libyan people call upon their leaders to have transitional justice achieved, national dialogue, and they call upon their leaders to call for the eviction of all foreign forces. This should be done through ending division in, within the different factions. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Ali. The panelists can use uh, the raise hand button to uh, pose questions, uh, and the uh, followers uh, and uh, other audience can use the Q&A uh, button. Mansour Lakhdari is the next speaker. The the paper is entitled The Algerian Experience in Ending Civil War, and he's an assistant professor at the Department of International Relations uh, in Ahmed bin Mohammed Military College in Qatar. He holds a PhD in political science uh, in, and international relations uh, from the University of Algiers. His research interests uh, include international relations, strategic and security studies, uh, political systems, and civil military relations. He has published several books, uh, including the evolution of the terrorism phenomenon in Algeria from the national to the transnational level and Algerian security policy determinants fields challenges in 2015. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Madam, ladies and gentlemen, our viewers, panelists, Peace be upon you all. Uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude to my brother and dear friend Ali Al Wahishi. It gives me pleasure to be with him uh, in this session. I'd like to uh, thank um, the Strategic Studies Unit and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, for providing me with this opportunity to talk about the Algerian experience uh, in ending civil war context and consequences of the security crisis. I'd like to present to you the, the Algerian crisis and the implications thereby. There are a number of terms, some call it the Black Decade, the national catastrophe, the national drama, and uh, other uh, terms. Uh, Algeria has witnessed uh, a security crisis. Four million people has perished. The economy was uh, in bad shape, and the institutions uh, have uh, disintegrated. And Algeria had witnessed uh, uh, exodus of people from the countryside to the cities, in addition to other psychological and social uh, uh, dramas uh, that are still palpable up to this moment. Uh, indeed, uh, the war started in 1998 and ended in 2005. It ended with the reconciliation uh, charter. Indeed, we need to understand the reasons uh, of uh, such civil war. Algeria has put into place uh, the February 1999 Act following the 1998 uh, uprising, whereby a second republic has been paved, has been established since uh, in 1962, whereby openness uh, was the main uh, title, but the democratic process uh, has been difficult because it faltered uh, on the 26th of December in 1991, 
on the second uh, occasion of the elections. Uh, indeed, uh, local elections uh, were held uh, to the GIA has uh, uh, won in most of the municipalities. Uh, as far as uh, the first uh, uh, election, legislative uh, plural election in 1991, this has led to the uh, victory of the GIA to the tune of 181% of the seats. Uh, Indeed, the rest of the seats were hung until the second round of the elections, which did not take place because of the decision of uh, abolishing the results of the first round. Uh, this decision took place because the heads of the military refused the results of the elections, uh, and Shadli bin Jdid was uh, compelled to resign. Indeed, it was a coup d'etat against him, and this had led to a constitutional vacuum following the dissolution of the parliament before he had resigned. And this had led to an institutional vacuum that ought to have been confronted with security and judicial-related measures that had led to violence in an unprecedented fashion. And thus, uh, we can see that violence has escalated because of the abolishment of the results of the election, albeit there were different motivations when the political landscape has witnessed a radical religious rhetoric because of the flagrant exploitation of religion in the practice of politics. The Algerian crisis has been related to two major important reasons, and two of them are religion and homeland, as if the two confront each other if uh, the religious uh, groups uh, declare jihad uh, on the symbols of the regime under the pretext uh, of uh, halting the project of the Islamic State uh, that was nigh before having to issue edicts, fatwas, uh, to target the Algerians, uh, the lay persons, uh, the authority talked about this issue from the security perspective in order to preserve the achievements of the regime against the jihadists who opposed the government. Uh, we can say that uh, the Algerian civil war was not based on sectarianism or ethnic region, religious related uh, motivations, uh, albeit uh, it was described as religious uh, because uh, all of the parties uh, called the uh, killed persons martyrs. Things uh, have escalated uh, to violence and counter violence. Uh, the uh, election process has been halted and uh, the GIA has been uh, dissolved and uh, mass murder uh, took place uh, and all Algerians uh, were subject uh, to killing without any discrimination. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, what took place in Algeria from the general kind of context. Uh, and uh, this uh, might have uh, been uh, similar to the uh, difficult uh, nuances of uh, the democratic process. As far as the government's uh, dealing with uh, the crisis, uh, it took 
two uh, shapes. Uh, the first one is uh, the security, and the second is the reconciliatory efforts. The security approach uh, meant uh, the utilization of the deterrent tools, uh, which uh, uh, prevented to have uh, any political initiatives uh, that might lead to the solution of the crisis. Uh, this security approach uh, relies uh, on the martial law that took place on the 9th of February 1999 for one year, then 1992 rather, and then it was uh, extended in 1993 for 19 years. And then it was lifted on the 23rd of February 2011. This martial law and emergency, the state of emergency took around 20 years and it was cumbersome. The government claimed that this is the legislative framework to deal with the situation and certain legislations were passed for the sake of uh, entrenching the role of the judiciary, the army, in order to overcome the crisis using security tools, despite the fact that the crisis was political. So this has led to grave implications indeed and added insult to injury. The Iron Fist has fed violence uh, and the number of crises uh, surfaced, especially legal and political ones. The other approach uh, that has been adopted uh, in dealing with the civil war constituted uh, the political reconciliatory approach. And this took place because of the failure of the security approach. Uh, it encompasses uh, the political and the conciliatory initiative on the part of the authority embodied in three main initiatives, the amnesty, the reconciliation uh, covenant, uh, and as well as the uh, political and peace uh, approach uh, or initiative. Uh, it is important uh, to, to have two observations vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis this approach. First, uh, this uh, approach has been launched uh, in line with the security deterrent uh, policy. The state of emergency was still going on at the time of launching this approach. The second observation is that this approach took shape in accordance with the uh, proposals of different uh, political leaders and historical leaders uh, that were refused categorically the saint initiative uh, or the uh, Rome Covenant that has been uh, uh, signed uh, upon uh, by the GIA, the Liberation Front, uh, the Socialists uh, and others. Uh, the authority has refused this initiative categorically under the pretext uh, of having a foreign element in it. Uh, let's go back to the three initiatives uh, I'd like uh, to allude to the fact uh, that uh, as far as uh, the first initiative, uh, the law of mercy, this uh, took place uh, in February 1995 and it uh, was the culmination of a new political approach on the part of the authority in dealing with the security situation uh, in order to open a new chapter and uh, have mercy on those who were involved in terrorist acts uh, following the repentance uh, whether the crime is is or does relate to uh, uh, security breaches or uh, otherwise uh, whereby uh, uh, sentences can be mitigated and these people can be reintegrated in the uh, social uh, uh, life uh, after repentance. This law uh, has been uh, 
uh, uh, resorting to mercy, repentance, uh, religious terminologies, as if the authority wanted to use the religious rhetoric to combat terrorism that uh, uh, had dressed the religious garment uh, fakely. And uh, indeed, uh, they considered the government members as infidels and thus the government wanted to use the same rhetoric uh, the religious rhetoric and the religious terms the second initiative is to do with the law of the reconstitution of uh, security Abdelaziz Bouteflika has uh, submitted this law uh, in 1997 as for referendum and it was a complementary part of the law of mercy and it had the uh, landmark of uh, Bouteflika before three minutes left before uh, uh, getting to the presidency post uh, he wanted to have his own initiative uh, in order to get to the presidency post um, this uh, law came along to expand the scope of uh, pardon for those who were involved in uh, terrorist acts Indeed, uh, Bouteflika wanted to drive a wedge between uh, those uh, so-called terrorists. Uh, the three initiative is uh, the uh, the uh, 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 covenant of peace, uh, and indeed uh, it was a third complementary part of the other two. Bouteflika depended on this as a cornerstone of his manif manifesto in 2004. The um, uh, National Reconciliation and Peace uh, uh, Charter or Covenant uh, has been uh, uh, floated uh, as uh, the cornerstone of the uh, referendum. And indeed, uh, he called uh, the Black Decade uh, as a national catastrophe and the covenant included a number of measures and special procedures that relate to two sectors of the society those who were involved in terrorism and those who were victims of the of terrorism the first uh, derived benefit from a number of measures and procedures uh, whereby uh, a pardon mitigating of sentences uh, were afoot the second sector uh, were remunerated financially as well as uh, the families of uh, uh, those who those individuals who belong to terrorist uh, organizations uh, the uh, National Reconciliation uh, uh, Charter or Covenant uh, was a solid uh, uh, charter because of the referendum, albeit it had some shortcomings, uh, especially when it uh, uh, surpassed uh, the uh, transitional justice uh, and was not clear as far as uncovering the truth, uh, as well as uh, it did not uh, uh, complete uh, the dossier of the unaccounted for. The dossier of the unaccounted for is uh, uh, still hung in the balance, uh, but uh, the charter uh, indeed uh, uh, was successful in uh, uh, opening a new chapter and to put the civil uh, war behind their backs. As far as the path towards democracy that I've started with in this paper to talk about the experience of Algeria, indeed, we have to go the extra mile especially when the security crisis uh, had uh, led to uh, different priorities, especially the stability in the land. And uh, this uh, uh, had uh, become the uh, platform of investments uh, of the politicians, especially after the Arab uh, 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 spring. Indeed, uh, the Algerian case uh, is peculiar and uh, it has certain commonalities with other uh, civil wars in the Arab region and others. Uh, and I hope uh, that uh, this paper will be read uh, because it has statistics, uh, testimonies, uh, and uh, it uh, clarifies uh, the Algerian crisis uh, 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 in a good fashion. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking much of your time. Uh, thank you sincerely. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansour. Now we open the floor for questions and comments. 
We have Dr. Mohanad Salum. Dr. Mohanad, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ayat, and my thanks to all the previous uh, presenters. I have a question to Dr. Ali al Wahashi and maybe Dr. Mansoor Lakhdari regarding national reconciliation. Dr. Ali al Wahashi, first, please, in the context that you spoke in, what did you mean by national reconciliation? I know you have mentioned this in the presentation. And the second point, if we compare what we call national reconciliation and with what is going on in Libya, if we compare that to the situations in Iraq and Algeria, that uh, possibly can benefit uh, Libya. Yankovic, apparently he was uh, an envoy in, Lib in Iraq before. The difference between the two cases of the Iraqi and the Algerian, when Dr. Mansour has mentioned in that the Algerian case was relatively successful. We'll take another question from Dr. Omar, then we open the floor, the floor for responses. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ayat, and thank you to all our presenters and this wonderful uh, uh, session. I will switch to English. Both the, by all of the civil war cases, but specifically in this uh, session, by the Georgian and the Algerian cases for, for a simple reason. So these are among the very few uh, countries that actually managed to, let's say, end between quotation, the, the, the civil war without a lot of international help. And then in the, in the case of Algeria, it, it relied on its resources uh, to, to manage a, a very uh, complicated uh, civil war dynamic. In the case of Georgia, and Professor David can correct me if I'm wrong, you had only the UN peacekeeping between Georgia and Abkhazia and, and, that, that, and it stayed as such. Uh, without like a lot of peacekeeping and enforcement of, of the of peace accords. Uh, but then you have a very deeper divide in the Georgian case because uh, the divisions were ethnic, linguistic, uh, regional, religious, uh, ideological. And then the only commonality, I think, with the Algerian case where, you know, the, uh, the old rulers versus the new rulers, the, the, the old communists between quotations versus the uh, the new ethno uh, nationalists between, between quotations, where the divide in, in Algeria was the, the old FL, uh, FLN folks versus the new FIS folks. And in Algeria also there was like an intra-Islamist that uh, Dr. Mansour, I think, mentioned, the intra-Islamist was a sort of also an Islamist civil war in the sense that uh, part of the Islamists were with the side of the state and others were, were in opposition. So both used religion in, in that way. But then you, you, you have in the Georgian case, uh, relatively speaking, a steady process of democratic transition, uh, steady process of oversight to a certain degree, um, despite the, you know, the, the foreign intervention and, and, you know, losing part of the country and uh, Russian invasion. Algeria was never invaded, was not invaded by France. Uh, Russia did invade it at some point uh, uh, or intervened in Georgia. But despite all these challenges on the Georgian end, and there was no oil resources in Georgia. Algeria had oil resources. Uh, but then despite all these challenges, somehow the trajectory went faster in Georgia. If I'm, uh, if I'm I, know, I know we had this conversation before but the, with Professor David, but the trajectory went faster in terms of democratization, in terms of transparency, uh, security sector reform. It was late in the summer, you know, I saw the opposition uh, camping in front of the parliament. Nobody was shooting at them. Um, you had a, a very uh, a transparent uh, Ministry of Interior where everything is glass, so whoever is outside on the street see it. Um, Algeria took, you know, st still not there yet. 
So uh, on both ends to Professor David and uh, Professor uh, Mansour, if they have any um, commentary or, or feedback on that, uh, thank you. نعطي الكلمة للدكتور منصور للإجابة ومن ثم للدكتور The floor to Dr. Mansour then to Dr. David afterwards. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Mohanad and Dr. Omar. Both their questions about the national reconciliation and the relative success and how can we call it a success or not. As I said uh, in, the, in, in, the, in my conclusions, and if I go back to the beginnings also, the, maybe it can be said that the, the transition the, the transition is still stagnant, so how can we judge the national reconciliation as a success? The success of the national reconciliation can be described so because it managed to stop the bloodshed in the country and various parties in the conflict, whether the victims of the uh, terrorist and terrorist actions, and also some of the former uh, the terrorists who benefited from the laws issued by the government shows that many Algerians after revising their own positions, thought, started thinking that what, what they went through was bad enough. They don't want anyone else to repeat the experience. And we will end the situation by saying bygones should be bygones and we should turn a new page. And we see that some who are activists in the terror groups, they went back to be reintegrated with society. In fact, they went to their own local areas. So therefore, we can say that uh, the outcome was the Algerians themselves have concluded that either they can continue fighting indefinitely or turn a page and uh, a page of national reconciliation and then maybe from then onwards uh, start uh, uh, doing something for uh, transitional justice or to find a new um, legal system that can deal with the post-terrorism phase. So therefore, at the level of the local societies, and I found through some of the studies, I concluded that the Algerians managed to go beyond the horrors of the civil war. As for the democratization process, the civil war or the national disaster uh, did not leave much room uh, to go back to democratization or building the, the democracy as much as the focus was going back to some sort of a stability and achieving security in the country. This has become the top priority and uh, no longer democratization was a priority. And of course, after the events of the Arab war, so some revival of calling for democratization, but uh, from October 1988 until the Arab uh, Spring events, the uh, some people started saying that 
Algeria started the Arab Spring well before other countries in 1988, in October 1988. So there seems to me there was a new uh, prioritiza prioritization on the basis of uh, a revisionist uh, position and uh, there may have not been unanimity, but there was some sort of a consensus that what uh, Algeria has lived through has provided the country with some sort of an immunity to avoid slipping into new adventures at a time when all the wounds have not uh, healed yet. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Now I give the floor to Dr. David. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Omar, for your very complex question. Uh, I agree that uh, lack of the oil and gas in Georgia plays a role in the respect, in, with regards of um, making Georgia dependent on uh, uh, good. Uh, cooperation with the European Union because we need uh, for various reasons again but we also are dependent on uh, normal uh, democratic development otherwise we will not receive financial assistance uh, from uh, international monetary organizations and including the European Bank of the Development and Reconstruction and so on. But as I mentioned, what we face recently, the government behaves strangely. You witnessed uh, opposition rallies, peaceful in the downtown Tbilisi, but now again, this also changed. Uh, church linked mob, uh, attacked them and police did nothing to protect them and now the street was cleansed uh, and we see that there might be a tacit uh, uh, cooperation between this church related militants and the government itself that's one thing what what makes uh, a bit worrying what what's going on right now in georgia on the other hand as to the past in the 90s what helped to finish civil war you know from the one hand probably there were, were uh, internal reasons maybe majority of georgians were against the civil war and that played also the role but uh, and the weakness of the uh, armed units themselves on both sides but we had uh, very influential inter external um, interference because not only un uh, observers were there when the war stopped between georgians and abkhazians these were russian troops who initially supported abkhazians but then decided to support Shevardnadze's government, who was completely unable after defeat in the Abkhazian part of the civil turmoil, was unable to stop internal ideological, also armed opposition of the previous government. And invited Russians, agreed to join Russian-led Commonwealth of Independent States, agreed to uh, sort of uh, give Russians the right to station troops in Georgia. And after that, Russian troops helped him to maintain power. So, um, I mean, but, but uh, again, uh, your suggestion to compare Georgian and Algerian cases is very fascinating. I did not know much about Algerian case and this division of the elite in uh, Algeria maybe gives ground for comparative study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. Um, uh, so I, uh, I also asked Dr. Ali Al-Wahashi as well. 
السلام عليكم first of all thank you Dr. Mansour and I hope to meet you again and my thanks also go to Dr. Mohanad for his question pertaining to national reconciliation in Libya. In fact, the national reconciliation means uh, creating some sort of cohesion between the national fabric in the state and stop violence between the different belligerents and also to close the gaps and divisions and strife and also, before any national reconciliation, there should be a national security plan to impose security because uh, Libyan society is divided over the basis of tribes and regionalism. So therefore, until now, there is no comprehensive project or plan to achieve national reconciliation because national reconciliation requires also a transitional justice uh, compensation and etc and uh, restore the rights and grievances for all the victims of uh, civil war which lasted over 10 years and thank you dr mohanad i hope i clarified it thank you very much thank you Thank you, Dr. Ali. Dr. Omar, again. Dr. Omar, you have something? Quickly yeah, for, for, for uh, Luca, it's just that it's, uh, so th the trajectory also seemed quite fascinating. Uh, you know, a civil war period, uh, sort of a repressive authoritarianism, revolution in 2000, toppled it, and then see to be a, a classic tra trajectory towards democratic transition supported by the EU. And then steady collapse, you know, not, not violent, uh, not uh, in a form of a, a coup or a bloody, another bloody round of a bloody civil war, but just a very steady uh, collapse. So was that by, you know, evil genius or, 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 st or strategy to, to maintain a authoritarianism or that is just because the reformists gave up uh too many um, you know criminality situation or like is, is there is there a dominant variable here this is my my question thank you thank you Professor Mark, for this question uh i think there are several uh things working together to to make this happen in such a way yes uh, you're right this was not a violent uh, a return to the autocr autocracy. Uh, this was uh, definitely a steady, slow uh, uh, tra trajectory towards the uh, authoritarianism again and towards this state capture. This was definitely not the work of the genius, but there are some uh, issues that can be seen in several uh, uh, countries, uh, not only in the Western Balkans, but uh, beyond, uh, that, uh, that are following this trajectory of uh, so-called uh, illiberal democracies, especially in Hungary and Poland and, and Turkey, of course, as well. And uh, some of these uh, uh, similar um, means were used in order to uh, acquire the power over the institutions of the state uh, one by one. But I think uh, it also plays along with the fragmentation of the opposition uh, uh, as well, which has failed to deliver on its promises. And of course, this has uh, deteriorated the legitimacy of the democratization process altogether. So this is the internal factor that uh, has played a role. And then maybe even more importantly, the external factor. So you have the situation in which the EU, which has been the major driver, as I said, of this transition uh, and democratization from, uh, from abroad uh, by the promise of the EU enlargement and the integration of the region, uh, has changed the strategy and has supported these autocratic regimes, especially uh, the autocratic regime in Serbia, uh, to follow these, these policies and uh, with, without any pressure. And uh, even, on the contrary, it helped them uh, achieve this kind of political uh, uh, oppression again, because it 
because of the belief that this kind of regime is the only one that brings the stability to the region where the stability is more, most needed for the EU interests, especially now with the very fragmented uh, situation in, in the EU itself and uh, the, problem, the problems with the, uh, uh, the migration crisis uh, uh, threatening the EU, etc., etc., uh, uh, the enlargement fatigue. So now, from their point of view, you have the interest to support these kind of uh, autocratic regimes uh, as once again these kind of benevolent autocrats. And uh, the the be best example of this was just yesterday. Uh, Chancellor Merkel was uh, uh, visiting Belgrade on, on its uh, uh, goodbye uh, tour uh, uh, throughout the, the region. And uh, it has stated that uh, the regime has made uh, significant steps towards the democratization and strengthening of the institutions. Although it's very, very obvious that the case is completely the opposite. But this kind of support just, just fuels these autocratic regimes and help them achieve the legitimacy inside as well. So I think there are a couple of uh, reasons why this kind of uh, uh, back, backsliding of democracy could happen in the region. And uh, unfortunately, I can see this uh, trajectory going forward as well. And uh, as you said, it's not violent up to now, but this kind of instability in the region, I think, can very easily uh, end up in, in some kind of a civil conflict again, I, I don't know, in Bosnia or, uh, or Montenegro, et cetera, et cetera, and then spill over to other countries of the region as well. So I think... The only way to obtain uh, and to achieve the uh, long-term stability and uh, long-term democratization is actually to follow through with the democratization process. And uh, But <laughs> unfortunately, I think this is a very, very difficult path to see at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Luca. I'd like to thank all the panelists for these uh, valuable papers. I'd like to thank uh, the Zoom followers and the social media followers uh, of our conference. And thank you for this interaction. I'll move to Dr. Omar Ashur for the concluding remarks, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayat. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please. I'd like to thank uh, all the participants uh, in this session. We have enjoyed this session immensely. I have uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, first and foremost, again, uh, I'd like to welcome you. A very good day to you our students, our followers, our panelists. I'd like to extend my gratitude to all of you. This is the concluding remarks of the third conference entitled Protracted Arab Civil Wars, Causes and Challenges. And this conference has in this conference, we have discussed uh, the Arab civil war over four days, eight sessions, and 27 uh, papers, uh, research papers, uh, and uh, scores of uh, uh, conclusions uh, and recommendations that we hope uh, we will collect in uh, a book. Indeed, 31 uh, professor, expert, and practitioner have uh, participated in this conference. I would like to thank them all uh, for their pioneering research efforts. Uh, our unit and uh, the Arab Center shall liaise with all of you, especially to compose uh, a book about the protracted Arab civil wars, uh, the challenges and uh, uh, the causes and the number of strategic papers uh, issued by our center, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. I'd like also to appreciate and extend my gratitude to Dr. Azmi Bshara, the head of the Arab Center and the executive manager, Mohammed Al Masri. I hope he will recover soon. And Haider Said, the head of uh, the research uh, unit uh, who was with us in the fourth uh, uh, session. I'd like uh, to thank my dear uh, 
colleagues, Majd Abu Amr, Mohanad Salloum, Dr. Sid Ahmed Boujelli, and Dr. Imad Mansour, all of whom have uh, participated in this conference uh, with research papers uh, 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 from different disciplines and different angles. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Abdulhab Al Effendi, the head of Doha Institute for Higher Studies, and Maryam Al Misnid, the executive uh, manager of the fi financial department, and Rashid Ahmed Hamad Naimi, the head of the Center of Strategic Studies at the Qatari Armed Forces, Marwan Qabalan, the head of the Political Studies Unit at the Center, at the Arab Center, Dr. Abdel Fattah Mohammed, the researcher at the Humanitarian Work and Conflict Center, and Dr. Ayat Hamdan, the researcher at the Arab Center. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the a splendid logistic efforts, uh, Mr. Mu'taz Nader, Nagam Al Aqad, Dr. Ahmed Hussain, Mariam Al Hawari, the alumni of uh, one of our masters, uh, 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 and Mr. Faisal Sawli and Amr Saad. And I'd like uh, to thank our hero in the IT domain. Ibrahim Abdul Jawad, Mr. Fawri, Hamida Rizada, Saif al Islam, and also other colleagues. I'd like also to thank the graduates and the students of the security uh, critical studies uh, course at the Doha Institute. Also, I'd like to thank. Mr. Muwaffaq Tawfiq and Samir Karum. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank all the viewers, the followers uh, on social media. And we have received hundreds of sound questions and uh, rich comments, uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't answer all of them because of the time constraints. So I do apologize and please accept our apologies. These questions uh, shall be submitted to the uh, uh, panelists, uh, the specialists, the experts. As far as the outcomes of the uh, conference, as we usually do, uh, as we did uh, in the previous conference, uh, from arms to peace, we have issued a book recently, Bullets to Bullets, uh, Collective uh, the radicalization of arms movements from the Edinburgh Press, 13 chapters that relied on 23 research papers and will be having the Arabic version this year from bullet to bullet, the same, with the same, obviously, uh, title. It will be issued by the Arab Center. As far as this uh, conference is concerned, we'll be having a number of uh, research-based outcomes. Uh, first, a book that will, ha will, will carry the same title of this conference, uh, a pro protracted uh, civil Arab, uh, Arab civil wars, uh, and it will re rely obviously on uh, the research papers of uh, this conference, and it will be issued in Arabic by the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, and in English by Western University Press. We will be having also uh, uh, strategic uh, research papers uh, issued by the Arab Center as well, with uh, some modernized kind of features. The uh, Arab uh, civil wars, causes and challenges, uh, will still a topic that uh, uh, ought to be analyzed further in the strategic studies unit, uh, as well as uh, in other departments uh, in the Doha Institute, where we deal with the, the studies of wars and their implications and critically focus on the Arab world in particular. In conclusion, 
I'd like to allude to the fact that the Arab Center will hold a conference on the political transition in Sudan and Algeria in the upcoming month, as well as uh, the uh, uh, Gulf Forum, which uh, will be held as well by the Arab Center. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good day and peace be upon you all. Much appreciated. Thank you.